I am very excited to have our next guest for our featured fireside chat. We have Mr. David Elliott, who is Vice President and Director of Haywood Securities. But he's also one of the principals and founders of Haywood Securities. And it is for that achievement and all of the incredible support that he has given to so many junior companies. He's been involved in over 400 financing, over four, financing and supporting because his support goes beyond just raise, helping to raise capital. Um, uh, junior mining companies that David Elliott has been a part of. And it's for that track record and his track record of uh, dealing in such an honorable way throughout the entire industry and having such high ethics in his business that he is being inducted into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Now, David has been in the mining sector for over 35 years. And along with his partner, Andrew Williams, he continues to generate investment opportunities for their retail and institutional clients. David began his career in 1968 with Doherty Roadhouse and McQuaig brothers in Montreal, and then he transferred to Vancouver in 1970. He also worked at West Coast Securities and Walwyn Stodgill, Cochrane Murray, until he joined forces with John Tonietti, David Shepard, and Rob Blanchard to purchase Haywood Securities, and that was in 1986. And check this out, back then in 1986, Haywood had just 15 employees. Now it has 313 and about $10 billion under management. Just a very storied career. Um, David, are you there? Can we see you? There he is. Oh, you might want to look at an old picture. <laughs> You're looking quite good. I like the slick back hair. Very nice. Very nice. He got all dressed up for us. We appreciate that. Yeah, I I got my only one tie on. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, you know, I reached out to David beforehand to see if he'd be interested in doing this. And he got back to me a couple of days later, only because he was fly fishing and then way up north in BC, an avid fly fisherman and one who also supports conservancy causes uh, throughout, throughout BC. Um, have you, did you reel in some big ones, David? How's the fly fishing been so far for you this fall? You know, it was a, it, uh, it it was it was pretty good. Uh, it was a low return year uh, for steelhead um, up in that Skeena River system, but we were fortunate. We were fortunate to be able to to hook some fish. And uh, my daughter came up for the first time her her first steelhead trip, and and she uh, landed two really nice steelhead. So that uh, uh, so she's going to be hooked for life now. Yeah, she is. Yeah. And she's already after me about next year uh, <laughs> that I have a spot for her. <laughs> and my son was up with me as well. And he comes up every year. So uh, he's quite a, he's quite an avid fisherman as well. And uh, anyway, well, how, big, a, how big is the family, David? Is it one daughter, one son? No, I've got two daughters. Um, uh, you know, Jessica is my oldest daughter. She, um, she has her own accounting firm with a partner. And then my son, my middle child is Patrick and he, uh, uh, he did his undergrad in geology and uh, geophysics, and, uh, and he spent seven or eight years um, in the field doing copper exploration, and then he went and did his master's in Australia and, uh, and an MBA at the same time. And uh, so he's uh, 40 just this year. My, then I, my younger daughter, Stephanie, uh, she works for Tech. She works for uh, Don Lindsay at Tech. And uh, she's been there 10 years now, I think, and uh, she's doing very well. And we have a, we're very fortunate. We've got three lovely children and they're very respectful. They work hard and uh, we have a very, very close family. This is pretty cool. That is, that. as the saying goes, when you have a healthy family, you have everything. That is really what it is all about. David, what was their reaction? What was your kid's reaction when they found out that dad was going into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame? Yeah, they were, they were pretty excited. And, um, I, uh, I was the last to find out, I guess, and <laughs> that my nomination was going forward and I, and, uh, anyway, my children, uh, yeah, they were very excited and very proud. Um, they, uh, they see me, they saw me work so hard over the years and I think, uh, they know my dedication and my respect for other people and, Anyway, they uh, yeah they were they were really pleased. 
how does it feel? I mean, as I can only imagine, I, I have no idea how that feels to, to be inducted into a hall of fame. Does it feel like, uh, is it like a culmination of a long career or does it feel like entering, you know, a group of peers? I don't know. What, what are the emotions associated with that when you find out? Yeah, I was, when I first heard about it, I, that my name was being put forward. It was, um, uh... You know, I was I was fairly emotional because it's uh, over my whole career. I I had never thought of that kind of recognition. I was always working with partnered with other geoscientists in a team environment and trying to build something. You know, uh, as a team, and personal recognition wasn't something that I I uh, ever thought about really, to be honest with you. And uh, I always kept a you know low key in the industry and. And uh, so when I, when I was found out that my name was being put forward, I, I mean, it was very humbling, really. I, I, uh, I uh, never, never thought about, uh, you know, getting that kind of recognition. Yeah. Well, it is, and it is fascinating because you, you have, you've never gone really to the limelight. Um, it's been just on reputation, just person to person relations that you build over the years. And people being so moved by that and being so enthralled with the support that you've given uh, over that period of time. And I want to spend some time diving into that, uh, into that career and see what lessons we can glean uh, from it. But I, I, I would just ask you, it is a little bit, um, it's not always the, the ordinary that someone would have as much success or be behind so many success stories that we know. We're going to touch upon those later in our conversation. A lot of money companies that our viewers are, are very well familiar with David was in there at ground zero and you might not know about them if he wasn't involved and yet you have avoided the limelight. Has that been by design? Is that something you intentionally kind of stay away from or why is that, you, that maybe the average investor um, doesn't know you as well as they might otherwise? Um, you know, I, I just, you know, my whole career, I, I, I got to develop a passion for geology and the search for, search for minerals at a very young age and uh, and initially that was uh, uh, Afton Mines. It was kind of a first investment I ever made and I got to know Chester Miller and Martin Gibson. Chester Miller, another Hall of Famer. Yeah and uh, you know I just developed a relationship with them over the years and that really developed a passion for me and I I, I saw those two gentlemen how low-key they were. They were you know very very calm. They were uh, focused totally on trying to build value for their investors. And uh, that really sunk in with me. And I, I watched that project go from early exploration through through development and then uh, construction and tech, of course, took that over. And that uh, that was pretty meaningful for me, just, uh, just starting out that. And so I never, uh, you know, through my career, I just I don't know. I, I don't know whether it's by design or I just never really, you know, being in the limelight and being front and center was never uh, a big a big issue for me. It was it was more of being part of the team and uh, in a supporting role and trying to help uh, people as much as I could that I, you know, respected and partnered with over the years. So I uh, yeah I uh, I don't know. I ended up. Maybe it looks like maybe it was by design, but not not really. I just <laughs> just what well, happened, it, I guess. It, and it worked out pretty well. So you probably had no reason to change it over the course of the years. Now, what about the what about the business plan at Haywood? Was there changes there? So when you come in in 1986 with your partners and you acquire this, maybe take us through what you believed you were acquiring, what you saw as the business opportunity, and then what it is today. Was it, is it much different than how you imagine it at that time? What was that evolution like for you? Uh, well, uh, you know, we, we worked for other firms and, uh, you know, we, we got experience by doing that, by working for other companies. And, and then uh, uh, we all got together. We knew each other. So John Tignetti, myself, David Shepard, uh, and uh, Rob, Rob came in uh, to, to work on the operations, and uh, George Bealey was who we bought Haywood from. Was stayed as a small shareholder, and uh, we just decided uh, 
Oh, John, uh, John told me for me one day and he said, do you want to start a new brokerage firm? And I said, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to David Shepard. He was my partner at the time. I said, you know what? Yeah, we would be interested in doing that. And um, I said, well, what about Haywood? And he said, well, no, you know, I don't think we should buy it. He was working at Haywood as a trader at, at the time. And uh, I said, well, what about Haywood? It's already up and running. And and David and I had previously opened an office for a meeting company and gone through the regular regulatory process. And we knew how much paperwork that was. And, and then Walmart Stodgill bought Mead. We ended up at Walmart Stodgill and, and, um, got, and John got in touch with us. And I said, you know what, let's talk to Haywood because they're already registered. They've got a, it might be a small firm, but it's, it's, it's a place to start, right? So that's how we ended up we talked to George Bealey and George said, yeah, he said, I'd be happy to, to sell a firm. And, uh, and we said, well, look, we don't want to pay any, you take your money out, we'll put ours in and, and so forth. And, uh, and so that's how we, you know, kind of bought Haywood and, and started. And uh, we had a vision starting out that we wanted to uh, build a strong retail base of uh, clients and institutional clients, uh, research, uh, uh, and for the mining sector, because we were, we were all investors in the mining sector. And, and I was totally committed to, I mean, I was very passionate about the mining sector at that time. David, did Haywood at that time, did it already have a reputation in the mining sector or was it no. just kind of neutral? No, they didn't. No, no. They were a small firm. They had a small retail base of clients. Uh, it was more of a service company. They serviced clients. So they didn't, it wasn't a firm that generated ideas or, or, or did, did, uh, did banking or finance. Okay. And so we had to really build that right from, uh, from the start, right? And so we, we started first with a retail, uh, building the retail base. Uh, and then into the 90s, we started building our research. Um, the banks uh, during the 90s were closing down a lot of their uh, mining teams. And so there's some very good analysts that came available. So we, we strengthened our research team. Uh, we added uh, banking to that. And we always had a very strong retail base of clients. So it was, uh, it was really our foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, institutional business is, uh, uh, we, uh, we set up an institutional desk in, uh, in 98, uh, formalized institutional desk anyway. And David Lyle uh, led, that, led that team and he came over from First Marathon. So that was uh, that kind of added uh, added something to our the dimension that we had and allowed us to uh, uh, do bigger deals and and access you know larger institutional capital. Was part of it bringing in foreign capital that maybe didn't have exposure or were aware of the junior mining yeah, opportunity so, in Canada? So going back just before uh, Haywood, uh, a company called Mead and Company that that we uh, set up in Vancouver. We had a London office and uh, we had a partner in London. And at that time, so this would have been the late seventies, early eighties, we were accessing institutional funds out of London and Europe to, and I think that's some of the first money that ever came into the, you know, Vancouver Stock Exchange or Canadian exploration. Um, and it was, there were big institutions, I mean, you know, the likes of Warburgs and, and they they had some punt money, you know, that they wanted to they, they were willing to take the risk on on exploration. So, you know, I, we were one of the first people that that started bringing that uh, bringing that capital into into Canada through um, our partner in London, Robin Andrews, and and uh, uh, Harry Dobson worked with uh, with uh, with uh, with, uh, with uh, Robin in uh, in London at the time, so. Um, you know, they were, they would service all, service all the institutions there. Um, they were, you know, anyway, we started doing financings in Canada with that, with that capital. And that sort of got us interested in, in accessing more capital out of Europe. And, uh, then when we formed Haywood, we kind of was, it was kind of a transition into that. Uh, we just, we had all those contacts. John Tognetti had some good 
impacts in uh, in Europe as well. And so, uh, as, as a combination, we kind of grew. Uh, we grew that just on a. It was more on a deal by deal basis. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, in the late '90s, we had a we set up a formalized institutional desk, right where, you know, they covered uh, covered all the accounts. But in the early days, it was, you know, kind of on a deal by deal basis. We would phone some of the chaps and see if they wanted to invest alongside us. And well, you uh, must have had some early successes to be able to grow it to the point where you had an institutional desk over in London. Yeah, well, you, yeah, you have some successes, but you have some things that don't work too. So, <laughs> that, that yeah, let's go with it. <laughs> yeah, wait. Right. It, it's interesting because now the the London circuit is such a vital one uh, for the junior marketing circuit. It's hard to imagine that wasn't all that long ago, but as recently as the late '80s, early '90s, that wasn't really the case. So, what was the investment discipline in Europe at the time? Was it just for producers only, and there wasn't that that junior knowledge? Well, there were so there were so few of them that were investing right uh, in in the space that you know they they'd invest in in uh, I mean the the funds that we were talking to anyway they they wanted to invest in the early stage you know high return high risk and so they'd take a very small percentage of their capital uh, and do that and so and so it was more, a lot of it was in, it was in exploration uh, initially yeah. Almost like a venture capitalist model, but before VC became the big thing in the tech space. Yeah. yeah Try to hit exactly. that home run. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, I'm going to mention, I've mentioned, uh, you know, well north of 400 uh, names that you've been a, a key supporter of, a, a key financier in. I'm going to mention yeah. a few for our, for our listeners. Alamos Gold, Bima, which now became B2, Midas Gold, Ventana, a huge story a few years back, Reservoir, the massive copper in Serbia that was sold to a Freeport. Uh, that's just to name a few. You've, yeah. uh, you may not have, uh, those, those companies may not have been known without, without your early support. So given yeah. that kind of track record, how are you able to identify companies that really have that real potential to separate the wheat from the chaff, as they say? Do you have any rules of thumb that have kind of steered you well in identifying uh, the best management teams and the best assets? Well, you know what? I, it, it, to me, it boils down to people. And, uh, and I've always been focused on backing um, intelligent science. And, uh, and so I've always wanted to partner with the geoscientists that, that have uh, strong technical skills. They've, they've spent a lot of time in their, their career in the field, uh, a lot of good mapping experience. They've uh, worked in different geological environments um, and have a passion for discovery. And they're very unique individuals. There are not that many of them. And, uh, and so uh, that's, you know, basically what I've been, uh, what I focused on is, is the people is a, is a very, very uh, strong suit because people, and, you know, good geoscientists, they'll find good projects, mm -hmm. right? And they'll then, and, and they'll be in the right geological environment, you know, they can host projects with scale. And, and so I, uh, you know, I've always, uh, I've always, uh, I've always tried to do that. And, uh, and that's been a, you know, I'm not a, I don't have a technical background. So I, uh, having that strong science uh, was really, uh, was really what I, what I, uh, what I needed. It's when you, when you put it that way, it makes so much sense. If you can identify the right people, then almost de facto, you're kind of getting the right jurisdictions. You're getting the right technology to help them because of the right people, right? They're going <laughs> to, they're not going to go to the bad jurisdictions. Is that sort of the investment philosophy that's, that's guiding this? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, I, I think I've lost you here. Can you still see me? Yep, we can see you. You, you can't see me? I can't see you. Okay, all right. That's okay. So, my, my wife would say that's no great loss if you can't see me. If you can <laughs> hear me, then that's something anyway. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Just, what was that question again? Sorry. Uh, just kind of following up on the, if you get the right people, does that kind of de facto take care of jurisdictional risk, technology risk, kind of the idea if it's the right person, then they're going to kind of handle those other risk factors for you. 
Well, he's gonna by having a, the strong science, you're gonna you're gonna manage that exploration risk to a certain point. Uh, that's one of the ways of I think you know people can uh, you know have a better chance of uh, having having discovery or and uh, but there's other ways of managing that risk too. Is 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 using other people's money, right? On on some of on some of the exploration, like bigger mining companies and. But you still have to have the, the science to be able to generate the ideas, to be able to uh, acquire the land positions because you want to you want to acquire them by staking. You don't want to acquire them from third parties because you, know, you lose a lot of leverage that way. And then you want to be able to work them up into a to a that you can see that there could be a scale a system of scale there. And uh, and by doing that, you can create a competitive environment with the major companies, the bigger companies. Uh, to come in as a partner, and you can from that you can get a better deal when you uh, when you're negotiating the terms. Okay, it yeah. all follows along from that. That's yeah, the, so and so well, and and I would imagine part of identifying the right teams is also having them want to work with you. And and on that front, you have developed a reputation. I know from talking to people in the industry. Uh, from going because because you would <laughs> you normally don't say this you have to find out from people that have worked for you with you um, you go way beyond what would can be considered normal levels of support for for the management team that you believe in uh, there's one yeah. story I've heard of you flying down on a moment's notice down to Peru because uh, an executive down there got got injured was seriously injured and you flew down there and stayed bedside for the week to make sure he was all right which he was thankfully um, financiers normally don't drop everything to do something like that. What, what do you think? Where does that come from? What motivates you to go that far beyond that extra mile? Well, you know, they were my partners and, um, uh, and I, um, uh, I just felt compelled to get down there and see what I, what I could do to help. It was a horrible situation that happened to them. And, and um, one was a Canadian, one was a Peruvian. And uh, so I, when I, when I heard about it, they had been doing some uh, reconnaissance work in a certain area and, and they had an altercation. And anyways, we had to get them back up to Lima because they were in an area that uh, didn't really have the hospital facilities. And so there was a, a little bit of work and, and trying to get, you know, a plane in to get them out and, and get them back to Lima. And, and so it was a bit of a process, but uh, and then, and then I was in the meantime. I was flying down there to to see them, just to make sure they were okay, and make sure you know if they needed any extra help, or uh, make sure they're in the right hospital, they're getting proper care. I mean, it was just, uh, and you know, I, I felt compelled to do that because they were they were my partners, and uh, I uh, yeah, and, it was. And all uh, they got over it, as you say, they got over it, and they got better, which is great. We were delighted at that, but I think that altercation still still haunts them a little bit. You know, they they still think about it for sure. Was I mean Peru back in the day? There's a whole shining path thing, was there not? Was it that? Was it? Yeah, this was time? this was uh, after that. This this was uh, after that. This was about uh, five years ago. Okay. Uh, but but going back to the you know nineties uh, in the in the nineties era and early two thousand, the shining path were. Um, you know, they were, you know, we were working in an area in northern, northern Peru at the time on some VMS deposits that we discovered and uh, uh, they were pretty, they were predominant in that area. We just had to, we had to be very, very careful. We didn't have any altercations luckily, but, but uh, that was an issue. It, listen, it's not an easy game that, that our industry uh, presents with us. It's it's amazing that we end up in these far-flung, beautiful places and we can meet local communities we would never come into contact with, but there is always that risk of danger. I think what's uh, it's extraordinary is not everyone, often financiers are you know comfortable behind their desk in Vancouver or Toronto or London and uh, aren't willing to hop on a plane and get down there, but that speaks to a, a certain uh, mentality and ethos uh, that you have. I also wanted to come back and, you know, exploring who Dave Elliott is uh, as a person. I, I mentioned it off the top, your passion for, for fly fishing, your big supporter and past chair of the Pacific Salmon Foundation. Um, but what is it about the sport that really ignited this passion in you? Um, 
Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Is it something, do you do your best thinking when you're out there? What, what's the great appeal? Well, I, uh, my dad originally got me into fly fishing when I was just a young, young chap. And, and I can remember crawling through the bush with him to get to this little stream, this little creek that had brook trout in it. And, and just sticking the rod over the, over the edge, trying to catch a little brook trout anyway. But, you know, it's kind of just stuck with me. And I always saw always something I, I like doing. And, and then when our children, you know, they were four or five, five, six years of age, uh, I introduced them to it into into fly fishing and and uh, they've continued on with it um it's just i don't know I, being out in the river all by yourself and uh wading in the river and casting and you know always the, the big fish is always going to be the next cast right. <laughs> you, know, you kind of uh, you've got to make 50 casts to catch one but, you, <laughs> but you, it's always the next cast you have to be um, an eternal and, optimist yeah no for sure and, uh, you know, you're in the wilderness and beautiful country, British Columbia. We're, we're so lucky to the country that we have here. It's just, it's so pretty up there. You've got the mountains, you've got uh, beautiful river valleys and they're, they're not populated at all. So they're, they're very unpopulated. So, so every day in the river is good for the soul. You know, it, yes. and you just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. I just, uh, I fished every day for three weeks this year. And everybody said, well, how can you do that? I said, I could have kept fishing. I could have stayed there. I, you know, I didn't have to get home. You might not just come back. Yeah. And so I, anyway, I so saw that's my favorite thing to do is river fishing, fly fishing in, in the rivers. Um, I have done some salmon fishing in the past. I am on the board of the Pacific Salmon Foundation Endowment Fund. So it's a fund that, uh, that uh, supplements uh, uh, funds to the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and they do a lot of good work in in British Columbia on habitat. And uh, we built a fish uh, uh, fish hatchery recently, uh, the last three years, up in uh, Rivers Inlet, which was uh, is turning out to be a real success story. They've probably done 2,300 ha different habitat projects since inception. And so the endowment fund, the income from the endowment fund. Uh, uh, pays their administrative costs. So any, any donations that the Salmon Foundation gets goes, it goes to 98% of it goes into habitat and, and programs. So, um, so that, I, you know, I spent seven years, seven or eight years, I guess, uh, volunteering for that. I, I also support the, um, the Fraser River Sturgeon uh, Conservation Society. And uh, that was originally set up by Rick Hansen a uh, good friend of mine and and um, he asked me to come and get and get involved and help support that and and so my son and I have been have been doing that uh supporting that for a while Excellent. Rick Hansen the famous uh wheelchair athlete yeah yeah he's Excellent. quite a he's quite a chap boy I'll tell you I mean if somebody should plug. be in, somebody should be in a hall of fame in Canada that's uh, <laughs> he's a he's the man boy I'll tell you he's yeah I, I love him he's just a great great human being Excellent. But, uh, and so, you know, fishing has uh, always been part of my, I've seen in probably just about all of British Columbia from going fishing and hunting uh, years ago uh, that I probably wouldn't have seen mm. by, uh, by not being in the outdoors. And, and so it's, uh, yeah. But between exploration projects around the world and fishing and hunting in BC, yes, you've seen a lot of remote areas that the average citizen can only can only dream of. David, from the from the remote streams of northern BC to the streets of Philadelphia, I, I've intentionally been avoiding the U.S. election all day. I think we all need a bit of a break, but I do want to get your perspective, having been an investor for so much uh, for such a long and prestigious career. The current state of the world. So, I mean, we don't have to dive directly into U.S. elections, um, but it is part of the mix right now between COVID. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, to state the obvious, a lot of volatility in the market. Uh, have you, give us your historical perspective. Have you ever seen times in your career as challenging as this to invest in? And how are you approaching this? Uh, yeah, there's been, no, I mean, I, this is a, this is a new area where you have a, a pandemic that can create so much, so much havoc and, 
as contagious as it is, and uh, affected so many different economies uh, in different ways. And uh, so it's uh, this is different times. Uh, I mean, the U.S. election, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, it, what's amazing to me is there's 350 million people there, and, and the two best candidates that they can put forward are, are what they put <laughs> are forward. Are not so great. <laughs> you know what? And, I, and, you know, I'm in Canada. Of course, we've got, you know, similar issues, but I'm not a big political person, so I, uh, I kind of stay away from the, from the politics. But... Uh, you know, you've had uh, different issues over the years where markets have had big, you know, volatility. And uh, you had, we had the financial crisis uh, back in 08, 09. Um, we had, you know, back in 87, they had uh, markets, uh, you know, uh, corrected badly. Um, and you had a different time. But, you know, th these all create opportunities. You know, and then you can't, I mean... The world's not going to go away and die, right? It's 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 uh, these market corrections. They they create opportunities of and, and valuations that uh, you you don't normally see. You only see them occasionally, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it, it. But it's hard. It's difficult to have the stomach to go in and and buy when you have these situations. And you know, back in a way uh, when you had the financial institutions that were closing their doors and governments coming in to bail them out. But, but, what, but what, what you have to realize is that the governments are going to bail them out. It's not, it's not like it's, there's not going to be no tomorrow. Right. Yeah. And so, but it's still difficult to, you know, people get, uh, you know, it's fear and greed, right. And people get scared and, you know, I, it was upsetting even for me in the, you know, eight or nine, but I, you know, I did, uh, uh, you know, I did buy a few things, and um, in '09 we set up Midas Gold, right? We we consolidated uh, uh, that land position in, in Idaho in 2009, and God, it was really difficult to raise any money. Nobody wanted to give us any money, and uh, you know, so most of the money we put in ourselves and a few close friends. Um, so I think you got to look at look at uh, uh, the opportunistic and look to the future, not, not look to the date or tomorrow. You got to look to the future and, and, you know, yeah, but it's, uh, it's difficult. Yeah. It's very it's, difficult. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, got, that, that... And then today, I mean, I mean China uh, seems to have starting to, to grow. Um, you've got uh, European or, you know, their, their economy is difficult. Uh, the U S is, you know, depending on which who you want to believe, uh, you know they've uh, they're looking maybe a little bit better than they than they than they were. Um, but the the pandemic and virus, there, there will be a vaccine. Whether this the Pfizer's one is, I don't know. It's people got to decide whether they want to take the vaccine if it's been rushed and you know they're trying to rush it here, rush it there. You know, maybe you want to wait and just see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah to see how that vaccine turns out. But, you know, there will be a vaccine and uh, we will get back to the norm one day, but, you know, the world's taken on a lot of debt in a very short period of time. And uh, it's hurt a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of small businesses and medium-sized businesses. I'm sure there's a lot of them that aren't going to make it. Yeah. Um, you know, they've been surviving on, on government subsidies and, you know, that's probably going to end at some point, but, they just may not have the staying power, which is really unfortunate because they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, everyday people that we all know that, you know, have uh, had a dream about having their own business and, and they build their, get their business built up. And then, you know, six months later it goes by and there's something that they, they, they run the risk of losing it. Yeah. yeah so it's uh, not very it's pleasant. unprecedented and it's tough to see. I'm sure we all know people in our network that have, that have felt the brunt of this more than others. And it, but it does point to your point about rising debt levels. It's hard to see any other way out of this other than continued spending. Already governments are spending yeah. at rates we've never, never seen before, which I think is very clear what the implications are for that on fiat currencies when you're printing that much of it, what happens to the value. Uh, bringing the, this conversation back into the gold sector, um, 
you know, if all this does portend well for uh, reserve currency like uh, like gold, but you layer on the pandemic that we've just been speaking about, so we're not seeing the regular kind of M and A activity we might see without a pandemic. How do you see this playing out? Are we going to see once we get through to the vaccine? Are we just going to see a deluge of M and A activity? Do you think we'll go back to those days of 2000 and up until 2012 when it was acquire at any cost, uh, acquire at any cost? How how do you see the the M and A space shaking out in the next say six to twelve month period? Well, a lot of the a lot of the companies that were active in the M and A space in the last last cycle, I mean they they just finished kind of cleaning up their balance sheets and licking their wounds from that. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think it's going to be a while before they, you know, we've seen a couple of Rangold, Barrick and Newmont, you know, which probably made some economic sense. Um, uh, but I, you know, we're not seeing, I, I, we're not seeing a lot of uh, M&A activity. And, and I uh, talked to one of our bankers the other day, just to try and get a better pulse on that. And, and he said, you know what, we're not, uh, we're not seeing a lot of activity. Companies that can raise capital, they can raise equity capital right now. And uh, and so they're not so motivated. The management's not so motivated to uh, to merge their companies or end up losing their company. When they can, uh, you know, raise equity capital, they can get to make sure their salaries are paid. And and uh, so they're a lot more difficult to deal with. And then you've got valuations going up and down, up and the valuations are all over the place. Uh, so it's, it's in that environment, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, have a lot of m and activity, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, will it come, uh, you know, it, I think, I think there will be some, I, but there's been so much lack, there's still been such a lack of exploration funding over the last 10 years and new discoveries made that there are not a lot of good projects out there. Yep. And, um, I know we've got a company in Nevada that's producing and we've been looking to make it bigger and add to it and we've been looking at we've looked at a lot of stuff over the last two years we haven't found anything that, that would that interest us for the size we are right yeah and so uh, I, I think that's a problem there's not a lot of really really good there's some recycled projects that um, that have haven't worked two or three times uh, out there but yeah, so I think it's gonna be a while before we see. Um, just, I mean, even if you saw something today uh, that you that you liked, uh, you you know you, you got to do the due diligence. You got to the site visit. Most a lot of times the data's at site, the core. You know, you, you just to you have to wait till this travel restrictions and pandemic is over before you could even start doing the due diligence. Yeah. Sure. And, then, and yeah. let, let's push down on that exploration piece because it'd be fascinating to get your perspective on that. We don't seem to be seeing these massive scale discoveries that we'd seen in the past. What do you think that that is a function of? Is it just a function of a lack of investment dollars flowing into it? Is it more, you know, there's the Ian Telfer camp that the big stuff is just gone. It's just been discovered. Um, how do you feel about that? Are we going to see some big discoveries if, if hot money comes back into the sector? Well, I think it's a, it's a, you know, there's a couple, there's a few reasons. That's, that's been one of them, lack of capital. I mean, there's been a, you know, just a penny is thrown at something over the last 10 years that you needed, you know, millions of dollars thrown at and uh, to make discoveries. I think the easy discoveries, uh, the easy near, a lot of the easy near surface ones have been, you know, been made. I think the, 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 the opportunity now is, is uh, covered deposits that are maybe deeper, and uh, I think there you can find some of an opportunity at finding um, you know sizable deposits are hard, harder to find though when they're covered like that. Mm -hmm. But I, um, you know, I think there's still deposits. I mean, there's still exploration opportunities to find deposits with, with scale. You just have to have the the right science with the capital. Uh, to try and find these deposits and uh, and, and it's got to be a, on a steady five-year plan or or whatever number of years right where it's not like you start up and you do a little bit of exploration oh gee we can't raise more capital so now we got to wait and go back or our budget gets cut and we can't 
So it's got to be just that steady flow of capital that will allow people the good the good science to to uh, to get out and find deposits. And they, I, I believe they will find them. But the the expiration timeline doesn't uh, coincide well with the cyclical nature of hot money flowing in and out of the sector. That's that that is a problem. What does either the science or your gut tell you is going to be the next region that is the most prospective that has a higher probability of maybe making one of these big finds that currently could be covered is there a certain part of the world that your spidey senses kind of tingle that you maybe keep a extra eye on for when opportunities come across your desk well uh i mean there's a lot of different jurisdictions that are geologically endowed um but are they jurisdictions that you can uh, that you can uh, get a social license permit and build a mine right and so, I mean, I think I would narrow that down to say, okay, what jurisdictions would, would do you think that can deliver uh, scalable deposits that you can build, you can actually get permitted and build a mine in? And, uh, and I think there are fewer and fewer, and f- they're getting, the, the world is shrinking where you'd, you want to put your investment dollars. And uh, I think, North America, Canada, you know, is a is a is a is a good place. I think Australia, um, you know, it's got the geology and it's got the uh, you can build a mine. Uh, there's a few places in South America that can can de- de- deliver. Uh, I think Colombia is a is an interesting, interesting geological setting where you have these deep seated intersection zones that can create uh, you know sizable deposits. Um, Peru. Uh, Africa, you get you get different country risks when you're going to these different jurisdictions, and it's just how how much risk you want to take. And you got there's so much risk in exploration, and you've got political risk. You've got you know, so it's it's the, I think the world's shrunk down where uh, people are uh, people are going to want to put their exploration dollars uh, going forward. So. So, but you're you're not closed off to certain areas in South America. That's interesting with Colombia. No. We actually had Serafino Iacono of Grand Colombia cold on earlier today, um, no. speaking to that. There are people, he seems to get it done, right? There are these, also these individuals, back to your point about people that seem to be able to go. Lucas Lundin jumps to mind, even uh, yeah. Claude Johnson, who I know you're a big supporter of Vima. Mm-hmm. They seem to be able to get it done. What 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 are those attributes? You, you've seen these people operate uh, over time. What is it that allows certain CEOs or certain management teams to be able to get corporate social or social license in areas that sometimes other companies cannot? You know, I think it's, uh, I think it's very, very simplistic. I think they, they go into an area, they, uh, they go in as a, you know, as a guest, you know, to the countries. Uh, I think they, uh, they network very well within the country and, 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 and find people to partner with within that country that will help them with the, help them with the social and political uh, uh, lobbying. And, uh, you know, you treat uh, the local people with respect. You, you help them in certain in- instances. They all, a lot of times in these small communities, they need help. Um, so you help them, you try and educate them a bit, uh, give them some jobs. You know, you, you become a partner of theirs rather than um, rather than the other way, right? And uh, I think I think by doing that, you, uh, uh, you 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 can develop a good relationship and and, and get a social license. And mm-hmm. but you can't just go in there with your elbows up and you know I'm a big mining company. I'm going to do it my way, and you know which is happen, happens a lot. Yeah. Uh, these small companies and big companies, they they get offside with the local communities, and but there's there, there's a better way to do that. You just go in and help them, partner with them, make them a partner. You know, it feels just, like once you once you get offside, it's very hard to get back onside. So that initial yeah. mindset that you bring to it, no, for sure, so vital. No, I know I've been in Peru for I don't know probably 25, 30 years. And uh, you know what? We've had some issues in the past, and we've learned from those those issues and some mistakes that we had made uh, early on. That, uh, but I, I think it's a it's a great country to great country to invest. I like the Peruvian people. You know, they're really really nice people, and uh, um, yeah. So it's 
some incredible projects down there and some the operators that get it right uh, can really get it right in Peru. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, the time has flown by. We're already at the end of the, the we're coming up okay. upon three o'clock. I would love to get your perspective. You speak a lot with, uh, with investors um, from all different kinds of disciplines. What is that perception around mining? We're hearing so, and of course, ESG is the, is the big, uh, the buzz three letters of the day. Um, where maybe even we want to break this question out into those three letters, environmental, social governance. Is one of those three letters, uh, does the industry as a whole need to do better on one of those three letters to attract the type of investment capital that it needs to, to sustain its exploration and its growth? Uh, as these commodities to really par- fully partake in the, the what looks like a strong run in commodity prices. I think uh, I think companies, the mining companies, are doing a lot better job on the social and economic, especially Canadian companies. I mean, I think they're I think they're um, they've got a good reputation globally for you know for the environment, but also on a, on a social basis. So I think. Uh, you know, I think the companies are really, they're trying to do a better job in those areas. And um, I think, you know, there's always room for improvement. Uh, but I think there's a, I think there's a dedicated shift, uh, you know, with uh, companies in our sector that are uh, trying to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, in investment capital, I think, I think in the investment capital side, you've got to show them returns. I think it's uh, they got to be seen or see where they can get a return on capital and and uh, it's like the big general funds. You, you, we need to get some of that money coming back into the resource funds and you know they're looking around and you know they haven't uh, uh, you know come in in any big way at all and uh, you know that kind of needs to that needs to happen and that capital you know I mean if you look at the, the senior companies you, you need leadership in the sector and I think. You know, in the, in the, especially in the gold sector, I think the, the, the big companies, you know, have showed, showed some leadership. They've cleaned up their balance sheets. They've, uh, they've got their costs down. Uh, they're starting to show, you know, from the price of gold, they're starting to show good profits. They're starting to give some of it back to their shareholders. Uh, they've had reasonable performance in, in the marketplace. So, you know, people, you're looking at that and everybody is still underweighted in the sector on a global basis. Yeah. They're, they're going to get forced to come to the sector because they need to, they need to show the returns. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think, I think, I think the money will come. Right. It's just, uh, you gotta, when it does, there'll be too much of it. <laughs> well, that's the problem. You know, yeah. You've, like you said to me a, a week or so ago, you got so few dollars at the bottom and so so much money at the top, right? It's kind of, and it's but it's a small sector, mm-hmm. right? If you you look at the capitalization of our sector, and then you look at a couple of tech companies, and <laughs> you see, you realize just how small our sector is. So, you know, um, a significant amount of money coming into that sector has a meaningful uh, result. We have one from the the audience here. I think picking up on our conversation uh, about areas, uh, you know, jurisdictions that that might be uh, prime for investment. We have a, a a Portugal booster here, which is not all all the time. I know Lundin Mining had some uh, stuff in Portugal. Uh, do you think a country like Portugal has a chance to generate some investor interest on the metals front? Have you come across anything there? I. Uh... I know a couple of people that are doing some exploration in, in, in Portugal, but uh, yeah, I, look, uh, I think Portugal's got some, uh, it's a good geological environment. Um, you know, you have to, the social, the social is a big part, I think, of Portugal. Um, uh, so I think, yeah, I think Portugal, I mean, there's some people exploring in Spain again. Um, you know, they're good geological environments. For certain types of systems so you know they it's a safe jurisdiction um they've got proper law uh you know there's no reason uh, why why capital shouldn't go to a, an area like that um uh, and, it, and it's just uh i think the biggest risk would maybe be on the social side of you know of, as long as you're not too close to a city or 
for a big town, you know, whether they want want the want, want to mine in their backyard. That's all. So I think if you're in a, in an area, yeah, I think yeah, Portugal's a you know, there's been some good deposits found there in the past. Absolutely. Yeah. It's also interesting to see when Europe might be interesting in the sense that kind of no one's really projecting it as a big growth driver going forward. It doesn't have like a Silicon Valley. So it doesn't have that tech uh, ingenuity that America does. And if we are in a secular bull market for commodity prices, I wonder if, you know, Europe, and actually I do know uh, the EU has actually engaged uh, our company Edumind. Uh, about trying to get uh, programs to educate people to, because they want to start exploring their own mineral endowment. So pretty, thanks for that question to the audience. Thanks for that response, David. Portugal, not normally something maybe a lot of our investors would think about, but maybe yeah. May, yeah. maybe there's a bit of uh, backwinds for European mineral investment going forward. We will see. We will see. Yeah. David, th thank you so much for your time. The time flew yeah. on by. Um, Okay. We, we do have one one last one here about and people like the the, the ge your your input on on geography uh, from another viewer. What about Southeast Asia and Indonesia? Have those have those come across your desk? Anything interesting? Well, yeah, I've got some experience in the past in Indonesia and, uh, and a little bit in Papua New Guinea. Indonesia Indonesia has recently changed some of their mining laws. And uh, I think uh, I think we're going to start to see some capital go to go mm -hmm. back into in Indonesia. And uh, I uh, it's a it's an amazing geological environment. And uh, as you know, it hosts you know large deposits. But they just had a you know their mining laws and uh, and the politics it kind of just destroyed the the exploration part of that sector over there. And uh, but I think I think it may come back. I, been recently recently talking to a, a couple of my friends in Indonesia, and uh, they think uh, with these changes that, that Indonesia is, is a country to maybe uh, keep on the radar screen. Excellent. I'm glad we made time for that. One last question. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> tip for our, for our viewers. We will keep a close eye on Indonesia. Yeah. David, again, congratulations on your inducted induction into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame next year in 2021. So wow. very well deserved. Thank you for spending the time with myself and our viewers and letting, giving us a window into how you've become such a successful businessman over the years. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate you, you having me on and I appreciate your support on the on the nomination. And, uh, you know, I'm very, right from the deep bottom of my heart, I Thank you very much. Appreciate awesome. it. Thank you so much, David. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks very much. Bye now. Thank you. Now that's how it's done, everybody. Talk about a role model in the business world to carry yourself in the way that David has over the years. is Very, very exemplary. And we're really honored to have him here and spend such quality time with us. That's something he does very often. So I hope you all enjoyed it. I certainly learned a lot from that.